office. Okay, we started before. <laughs> Hi, you're joining us live from Akshat Bhatt's office in Delhi in a beautiful green area, which you can see behind us. Now, architect Akshat Bhatt is a multi-hyphenate. He does multiple things, which we're going to let you discover as our conversation goes on. And his studio is a multidisciplinary studio as well. We're calling the session Ask Akshat Anything. So if there is any question you want to ask, free advice about your home as well. I'm just putting it out there. He's here and he's smilingly and willingly going to answer that. Hi Akshat, how are you? I'm well, thank you. We're also going to log in online and see your questions. So just give us a second here. We are live. Yeah, here we are. So I'm just going to try to mute us as well. Sorry, I'm really technologically... Uh, meanwhile, Akshat, tell me, um, what have you been up to? What's new with you? Uh, just a lot of work. I think we've been really busy this year. And uh, yeah, work and just a little bit of fun keeps me really, has kept me really occupied over the last few months. I don't know how much you guys know about this, but Akshat's actually studied overseas and worked under some amazing architects. Do we sort of see some of the influences in your work? Um, I think there is an influence in how I work, in the process of the work, in the challenges that we set up to achieve you know, to, uh, as a studio. Mm -hmm. and in the result of the commissions as such. Um, but have I worked with any of the studios I idolize? No. Okay, good to know that. I mean, that's the revelation. Of course, uh, thank you for telling us that uh, you have sinks and everything. We can see the comments coming in. We'll let Akshat know which faucet brand you handle. That all's going to happen. Um, okay. We're going to start off with one of the questions that you guys have asked and not what I've prepared. So Sneha is asking, I want to change my kid's wardrobe panel color. Would chalk paint work? Chalk paint is uh, blackboard paint. No, I don't. I would not advise that. Uh, you just get too many stains. Um, whenever you do something, I think it's best to do it for longevity. And while you do want to create you know, a, a visual impact of sorts, I feel you should always do things that will last beyond your expectations. And chalk paint Great. may not. Okay, chalk paint is the paint that basically you can write stuff yes. on. Yes, right? yes. We, well, so you, you're, ha you're probably safer going or going with a laminate or or with, you know, a sheet of glass, or such, uh, that so that you can wipe it off. Okay, but if you want, like, you can add a blackboard or something, would that, I'm guessing she mm. wants her kids to draw. Yeah, you could always, you could actually just, we've actually done a child's room with a giant sliding blackboard that covers, you know, their bin of toys and whatnot. So you could try something like that, yes. But remember that it's going to look messy and it'll, and you'll have to keep fixing it every few months. Fixing it in what sense? You'll have to go over it with a coat of paint or, or really, really clean it deeply. Okay, the Mommified is asking, Hi, I've booked a flat which is semi-maven. The only problem with the flat is that the entrance to the kitchen, which I feel is small, how can we change that and make the kitchen look more open? Well, <laughs> I, I mean, I, it's hard to, for me to give a serious answer without actually looking at a plan. <laughs> but generally, I think if you can draw your attention towards one wall, it tends to draw the space. If the space is the longer side, is better for you. Now, how do you make the space feel larger and livelier? Of course, get in as much natural light as possible. You could always open space out. You could, you could punch glazing or glass through, uh, you know, between the countertop and the, you know, and the overhead units to try and get light from one side, or even from within the interior space to sort of create a kind of connection use a little bit of mirror or reflective sort of actual uh, reflective tiles or, or, or steel and that might be of some help. Do you think like the West has been obsessed with subway tiles and we haven't really seen so much of subway tiles in kitchens in India. Do you think we'll somehow see that some, sometime soon? 
Yeah, I'm sure we will. Uh, although I don't believe in uh, creating spaces and using materials that are trend driven or trend oriented. So you must understand that those styles were used in some ways for a reason in a certain act in a particular era. They don't continue to be used today, right? So there is a big difference between how public spaces were dealt with in the past and how public spaces and, and surfaces are dealt with today. So when you want to uh, when you want to create space, you must always think of longevity and such. Remember that when any surface in your space actually affects um, the way you're going to perceive that space, and space is primarily for your mind, you know, and then it's meant to perform. And uh, by sort of creating things with lots of joints and such, and you know, sort of working with trend-driven textures as such we often tend to clutter our space and you'll find that in a few years you're sort of tired of it or it's actually fatiguing your mind and you don't really realize it. Take away, don't just follow Pinterest trends. Uh, we have a design studio called SM Design Studio and they want to, uh, you to tell them more about your experience as a designer and architect on the business front. It's a tough business, I'm guessing. I think any business is a tough business and um, it is any business has its own set of nuances and and it and in order to excel in it you have to work hard and um, and continue to evolve and i think there's always some element of luck and some and and a large element of skill um, the good thing about architecture and design is that it's not a competition but the the problem, as with any other business, with the business of architecture, is that it is a competition. So, you know, uh, the there are no shortcuts to honing your skills, developing your studio, developing your colleague skill sets, um, because eventually, if you have to grow, you have to work with a larger set of people, um, grow beyond yourself, and um, work at scale. I find that often people get trapped in this, you know, debate of not understanding the business of architecture because they don't attempt to work at scale, right? Uh, in a lot of architecture and design schools, we're groomed to think that small is beautiful. While small is beautiful and it is impactful for the individual, you do need to think, you know, for larger communities um, because that's really where uh, and you know a, a serious architect or a serious designer can create impact so that next question we have from interior Amira how to hide a 25 inch beam in the center of the room in a 9 feet height room it's 40 feet by 20 feet half of combining two flats and a center cross beam throughout I'd like to say that made a lot of sense to me but I, I'm guessing his smile is saying he understood uh, you can either express it by bracketing that space with walls. So you can either, you could either express it and enhance that, you know, you know that, that drop in space, or you could actually start working to sort of camouflage that, that element. And that can be done through color, through texture, through, uh, you know, by creating sort of rhythmic arches or, or such. We've actually recently done a project where we did like a paper fold to hide uh, a few structural elements because we didn't want to see them but we also wanted to create like a visual draw so it became a triangulated expression in some cases we've actually worked with arches and cross walls as well in interior spaces so you could try that I hope that answers your question now before we take more questions one of mine um, so when did you realize that you want to be an architect and I read it started at 13 but so how when where well, it started at 13 because my, you know, an uncle of mine, my uh, dad, one of my dad's closest friends was redoing our house. And when I walked in, I saw, uh, you know, wa walked into his house one night, I saw him sitting on this a naught size drawing board with a parallel bar and coloring the plans to our house. And that, you know, the those days, this was in the early 90s, you would use um, technical stationery and technical ink um, and that entire contraption looked like, uh, you know, a really intriguing, you know, set of things to me. And I wanted them. 
and it was that desire to own that stuff that you know that prompted a question from me and he said well you can have it if you choose to become an architect and so i declared it i said well i want i want to become an architect then so i mean if not an architect would you have been anything else or like you never thought anything beyond architecture well you know it just so happened that i started playing the guitar when i was 13 at around the same time right i mean i made that proclamation to be an architect and then i just then i forgot about it uh, or it became an excuse to not study because in those days you didn't really have to study but i was terrible at drawing um i did at around the same time pick up start learning how to play the guitar and you know i had played musical instruments before but when i picked up the electric guitar uh, and started playing metal and rock I- it sort of really got me hooked so for the next 5 or 6 years i was practicing 20 hours a day on my on the corner of my bed and um, playing gigs and rocking out and growing my hair long and so if it wouldn't have been if it wouldn't have been for architecture i would have been probably become a guitar player i'm not saying a musician i would have probably become a guitar player architecture's gain music's loss but we're very happy that he came towards our side um an award that you would look forward to i think a pritzer or an Ara- aga khan right i think all of us would look forward to those um it, but it's really determined by the by the quality of work and the quality of the commission that you do and how that work actually contributes to a larger level impact um i don't believe we've done that yet hopefully we'll do that uh, in the coming years great so for those who don't know akshay does a varied number of projects they're private residences the commercial spaces he does hotels with as much of ease as he does workspaces uh, do you have any favorites any favorite design like you've done so far um it, you know it's hard to say because we we sort of in involve ourselves with a lot of intensity and our work is the result of our projects is sort of process driven i'm not saying the design uh process is well i'm not saying it's the work is an expression of the process of design that's not something that we do it's we're not academics but our work is really really um involves a lot of technical details and an expression of things for longevity so you know you do tend to get involved i think if you were to ask me what are my personal favorites they would have to be the ones that taught me the most and they that doesn't necessarily have to be for the kind of project it is and it has to be for the kind of involvement that i would personally have had in, have have had had in those projects um so you know i remember when we were doing ranakpur it was a huge project i was 28 years old and um we finished that project in i think 24 or 27 months so and you know that was literally every second week standing at site for 3 days in rajasthan where you know it was hot in the summers we had we were dealing with you know a water table of which was just 1 and 1/2 feet above the ground we had workers in dhotis you know sort of painting steel sections 13 meters above without harnesses so it was a great learning experience for me and so it, it was an intense learning experience mm, then we around the same time we did the discovery center i mean and there were other things happening so at the discovery center it was similar where you know we we did a building that was 105 meters long and uh, over 7 acres of land in just about 8 months right so putting that together prototyping that in itself then finally deputing someone from the studio to monitor that work and monitor the performance of the project um the india pavilion where we did you know 17000 square feet under extreme sort of um, stress and in, uh, in, in an extreme performance under extreme performance anxiety for um, you know in 22 odd days to deliver something that was going to be inaugurated by the prime minister of india and the chancellor of germany at the time was uh, was quite something yeah and that you're you're sort of dictating things to german and swiss contractors that in itself was you know the, you know the communication paradigm and you know the the performance levels desired for that project were quite something um doing the oberoi grand calcutta which was you know from the oldest hotel in the country and then to 
rip out you know the public area and then to start with a restaurant there in itself um, where we were dealing with an undocumented building you know we have to change things ensure that the result is of the project is intense where i never believed that a studio like ours could be commissioned for a project like the oberoi grand um so yeah when well, i mean there's, there's learning in everything but uh, if i was to start pen penning down memoirs there would be some of these uh, at the top of my head nice um what's a day in the life of akshat bhat like i wake up at uh, I will. I wake up between 4:30 and 5:30 a.m. and I snooze again for about 20 odd minutes. But this is without an alarm, so I'm I'm up and about by six, and I'm just. I actually do nothing. I I dabble for a couple of hours. That's time to myself, and um, you know, one a cup of black coffee, and I'm at the studio by nine nine thirty, usually, and then. Uh, yeah uh, engaging conversations with my colleagues and um a you know a fairly quick lunch and then the day doesn't end it doesn't end till you know i think i think then it's extemporary so the first half of the day is usually controlled with whatever it is that i want to set out to do be it sketch out something strategize a day strategize a week the second half of the day is um, you know my time for others where um you know that's when i get my questions and queries and what not and uh, do my meet conduct my meetings if uh, or attend meetings if i have to um i'm usually home by 8 8:30 odd um i drive myself more often than not and um yes yeah, so i listen to music sometimes in the car and when i get home i'll plug into a very loud amplifier for about 15 20 minutes to really really de-stress or just let it all go <laughs> and then um sometimes and more often than not than dinner with friends and um, then sleep at 12 so uh, akshar and i we have known each other for quite a while now and during this time one thing i've noted is that he has a lot of opinions and today we're going to just call him out on that so akshar is there something in indian design and architecture you wish was changed mm yeah i mean i've i've said this openly that i think um, we have to stop talking about changing the world and actually start changing the world so we have to start engaging in more meaningful design uh engaging in more meaningful dialogue you know i think we engage in really superficial dialogue i i think our i think we haven't bothered to change the cons you know to to sort of help the the construction industry evolve in the last 20 25 years whatever has happened um, you know as technical impact or qualitative impact has come from um people in the industry like you know industrial setups within the system um of companies suppliers it hasn't really come from architects um i don't think our dialogue on how cities and spaces should be has evolved at all we don't talk about the space in between buildings um because we don't talk to each other i think i think one of the biggest problems in indian architecture right now is that people who and maybe that's a problem with architecture across the world is that people who don't see eye to eye on opinions don't talk to each other right so and, and we're all very comfortable talking to people who would have the same opinion as us and that just makes for a very uh, then makes for a one dimensional world and um, we continue to do more and more of that i think there's a lot of um, there's a lot of functions we attend i mean uh, there's a lot of functions that are happening today a lot of architectural events what comes out of them is very little right so i'm I've, i feel i really don't feel motivated to attend them and while some of us are treated like superstars uh, i i at least i for one don't uh care to be treated like one i think i'd be a lot happier if i was sitting in a closed room full of peers and actually having a real conversation on what 
we've done wrong and what we've done right. That's so interesting. And that brings me to my next question. So architects in Mumbai are known to work hard and party together, but the same can't be said about architects in Delhi unless they're meeting each other in complete the secret areas and all. So why is this that the, you know, the Mumbai architects seem like, okay, they're all working together, they're partying together, um, but somehow the Delhi architects, don't you guys meet up? Or secretly meeting up and don't let the rest of them know on Instagram. Mm, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not. I'm not in Mumbai, but I know uh, I have a few friends in Mumbai who, who, who do seem to be a fairly close knit community. Um, I think that is also the case for India, uh, for for Delhi. We do. Uh, when we meet, there is a sense of bon humming. Um, and usually when I know that uh, there are a lot of people that I know that are in town, I'll, I'll probably book out a place in a bar and say, okay, let's, you know, it's open for all, come come as you'd like. Um, but I, for one, prefer meeting in clo smaller closed groups. So I do have a few architectural friends. Uh, I do have a few friends in the architectural fraternity, and we do hang out once in a while. Uh, but it's usually not in large groups. Yeah, it'll probably be in groups of like five or six or seven and or eight. Um, it won't be this huge party circuit. Maybe the Bombay guys just uh, have like more of party. a Bollywood <laughs> lifestyle. <laughs> yeah. Or they just maybe really like to party. Um, is there a building you wish you had designed? Oh, there are many buildings that I wish I had designed. Um, the cheese grater, as it's called, is a building by Roger Stirk Harbour that I, in London, which I really wish I'd designed. I think uh, the Louvre at Abu Dhabi by Jean Nouvel is a phenomenal project, and I wish I'd done that. Um, the Centre Pompidou, of course, if, you know, a anything uh, in that vicinity. Um, the the Museum of Jewish History by Daniel Liebskind in in Berlin, that's another. So yeah, there are quite a few. I can't seem to think of one in India that I would, that I wish I'd done. Um, the Parliament, maybe. Well, if that project were come to me, I mean, hats off to, you know, to to Bimal Patel for having and his office for having pulled that off, in the time frame that they did and the manner in which they did. Um, I I it, it was a daunting commission to begin with, uh, and it continues to be. Uh, it's a, I think uh, it was a, I think it was a really, really serious uh, project. I don't think too many studios, I, I w I'll be cursed for it, I don't think too many studios had the wherewithal to do, to pull it off successfully in the time frame required. So I think architects has changed, right? The demands that we are taught in architecture school for a studio to perform under are very different from real world demands. And that has changed as, you know, uh, well, A, performance criteria, B, security conditions, uh, C, the technical sort of back end and the services on architecture, uh, the environmental impact has, you know, sort of ha now has to be considered in a manner that it was never before. And I think that's something that the world over the younger fraternity doesn't actually understand uh, or appreciate, uh, you know, the, the gravity of that. So, uh, you know, if you have to do significant infrastructure projects or really large, impactful um, public projects, you need to be a studio with a certain amount of weight behind it to be able to pull it off successfully. Next one's not a question, but I think you have some fans out there. So Mahima Singh, we're just going to give you a shout out here that you really love what Akshat does and you find him an inspiration, message conveyed. Keep the questions coming. Akshat is very willingly answering all of them. So have more questions. And in case I've missed your question, just repost it so that it comes right up front right now. Meanwhile, um, I want to know, what are your thoughts about the recent rise of decor and design influencers? Uh, I mean, we have influencers on Instagram, on social media, on TikTok, uh, which is banned in India, but like various places you have it. Instagram has seen a rise of, like a phenomenal rise of design and decor influencers. What do you feel about them? Or 
you haven't really been keeping up to date about it. Well, you know, I tried to get into the whole in Instagram influencer thing a while ago. I think, mm, well, I, I unfortunately do think a little more seriously about space and and, and infrastructure and planning. And I, you know, th I, I believe that that the pastiche that mo that that is most of what I see on 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 social media is something that I can't subscribe to. But I. I'm also just a very poor, you know, sort of engage a person to engage with at that level. Um, you must understand that th I, I don't see serious dialogue on Instagram or, or social media per se. And um, so you can't, you know, I think there's a difference between reading a book and reading a snippet, right? So the Sometimes you do need to read a long book to a, to to understand the gravity of some such, uh, which is p it's possible that you know a snippet on Instagram doesn't give to you about creating space, about dealing with space, about dealing with 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 uh, projects as such. Um, so you may get one fun quirky idea, you may get one fun serious idea, it may engage you visually, but there are deeper levels to it, if that becomes your window, uh, you know, into a sort of, you know, ra into that, it, that becomes a window to the world of sort of serious design, then great. And I think in to that extent, I would really, uh, I would encourage and embrace that, you know, that, that, that trend for lack of a better word. Um, but if it is going to be superficial, then I think we, we've done too many superficial things over the last 30 years that have not res that have actually resulted in the state of the state of the world being what it is today. All right, um, that's interesting. Next question comes from Maria Suresh. She's asking any advice for young architects. I think that's really important because uh, I have seen, and you know, if you can just pan over there, can we have a look at all the young architects in uh, Akshar's office? As you can see, all of them hard at work. It's an open plan, actually. We've just cordoned this area off so that you can hear him better. So yeah, coming back, any advice for young architects? Um, I think you, I think I th the foundations that you set for yourself in the early years of your career uh, are the most important things that you know um, for any designer and I, I would imagine in any profession so don't just wing it I think you need to find the right studio to work with sit in there for a while learn from you know the the opportunities that that studio provides and learn from the mistakes that the studio makes you know nothing is perfect and um, then set out to do your own thing. Once you have that, you know, the once you have the, you know, enough uh, knowledge and experience, um, and once you have a unique enough story to tell, right? You don't have to be. You don't have to replicate something. I mean, you have you should ideally aim to just be yourself, uh, but very few of us get that opportunity, yeah. right? And I think a large part of uh, the reason why we don't, why people don't, are not able to capitalize on the opportunities they get is because they don't may not have the necessary skill sets and experience to actually deal with it. Uh, so we'd rather have one less building than one have one more bad building. Well said. One less building than one more bad building. Uh, that's really nice. I'm going to quote you on that multiple times now. So uh, Bharat Pathak wants to know, what's the future of imported furniture brands in India? By the number of brands that are launching in the country, it looks pretty bright to me. What do you think? <laughs> I, I can't say. I actually haven't used a foreign furniture brand uh, or an imported furniture brand in a decade. There'd be the odd iconic piece from, you know, 
that's designed by Charles and James or Ron Arard or such that we would pick up. But most of what we do is designed ourselves and it's made here in India. He actually dabbles in product design, you know, that was going to be one of my questions, sort of that's already leaked out. But yeah, so the, so uh, Akshat is known for product design as well, but for those, if you know, you know, kind of situation. So can you tell us a little bit more about the product design? Uh? Well, look, it's, you know, architecture is about strategy and detail. So, you know, that's where interior design comes in, because I, I would imagine interior design also has a level of strategy and detail. So it's when you're sort of working around something to be an ideal impact, an ideal uh, sort of resolution for a situation that for, and it's a condition that wh you, where you can't find a replacement uh, off the shelf is when you start designing to temper, you know, furniture or a light fixture or, you know, even a, you know, even a desk organizer uh, for, you know, for a particular condition. And that's, you know, we've been doing that for 15 or 17 odd years, and that's what sort of led us deeper into this rabbit hole of product design. We continue to do it. We do our own fabrics. We do our own drapes. Um, we do our own rugs. Um, so, and there are, and of course, we work with who we believe are the best in the industry in that, for that particular discipline to produce it for us. So if I want to come up to you and ask you, okay, can you design me something uniquely for my home? <coughs> I may not need you to do up my space, it's done, but I want furniture from you. Would you entertain me or, or probably just say, uh, sorry, it's only if you do a project with us? Um, well, we're at the moment, uh, we can't entertain you for something so, s so specific. specific. But... Um, I think in the near future, there will be a system wherein you could procure something that architecture discipline has made and may be tweakable to your requirements. My next question is that, uh, is there an upcoming Indian architect who you feel is like, you know, going to really make it big or doing really interesting work? Do you see that or um, it's too early on in the Indian sort of scenario currently to talk about it? Um, uh, there are quite a few young studios that are doing interesting work. I haven't yet seen something that's really intense and got me thinking or got me hooked onto it and say, well, let's, let's follow this person. Let's follow this person's uh, career path or trajectory so far um, I'm but there are quite a few there's there's a couple of studios in Bangalore that I've seen that are are doing interesting stuff which is scalable there's um, a couple of studios in Goa that I've, that I've seen um, but remember that you know you're a young architect till you're about 45 you know and that's what's considered young the world over so if you graduate, you know, and, and you're sort of re you start working at 22, 23, then you, you know, work a few years or you do your master's or whatnot, it really takes a good decade, decade and a half before you get the opportunity, by, by that time, till it takes a decade or decade and a half before you to get the opportunities and actually deliver them for them to be meaningful enough. And therefore, you know, 40, 45 is, is, is still a young age, right? And that's what I consider a, a young studio. That's interesting. Uh, we have a question from Kashya Bhavika. What is the future of architecture with respect to AI? A lot of us are anticipating job losses in other spheres. Well, I, I mean, technology has to evolve, and you know the the the. I think what's happened in the last few years is there's taken leaps, um, and these these sort of it's taken faster leaps, and I think these leaps were going to happen. Um, would it replace, you know, a serious architectural mind? No. Does it pose a challenge to a serious architectural mind? Yes, um, because you have to up your game. You have to. And actually, I think it's. I think it's a. I, I actually think it's a really positive change. I think you really have to understand 
where you have to focus uh, your discourse and what you have to focus your discourse on. Um, so AI is, at the moment, I think AI is only as good as the input it's given and the input it borrows, right? And it's tweakable. I mean, there are, there are people in the studio that are engaging in it. Yes, uh, some things that, something, some, AI makes some tasks very easy. So it helps you automate certain things at the moment. Uh, will it help you automate entire built environments? Maybe, um, but and then that would mean that our role as designers and planners has to be um, even more intense. So work harder. Work harder, guys, if you want to survive in this cutthroat industry. Is there a um, design no-no that, you know, you just like avoid it regardless of whether you go to an architect, go to an interior designer, there must be some design no-nos that we can sort of get for free on the session. Uh, well, for me, there's one carte blanche, which is, and it's not a no-no; it's a yes, right? Okay. Height, light, and space. If you if you use that as your fundamental edit or your fundamental parameter to gauge good space, uh, you'll end up you'll you'll find you reject a lot of clutter, right? I I don't like clutter. I don't think anybody does, but you know, often in trying to create a theatrical environment, we engage in a lot of pastiche, right? Be it, you know, to, you know, be it pasting of textiles and so on and so forth, just, just to create a differentiated space. And I think I see that more often than not in indoor space than in outdoor space. But yeah, if you, if your, if your quest is clarity, then you'll end up removing a lot of things. Um, that would then distract from, you know, your project as such. Which is true about your projects, right? I mean, they are they are more towards minimal, but yet you manage to get in a lot of drama. It's high impact. Like so, how do we achieve that? For most of us, um, you know, minimal can almost be clinical and boring. And you, how do you add that drama and enough space for what you need and for your memories and? I think our quest is always to have, well, to have, we have core values, but, uh, and design has to be, uh, design has to be, like I said, for the mind, it has to be a positive, I mean, we, you aim to create positive environments, you aim to create distinctive environments. Um, and usually for the kind of work we do, we're asked to create bold environments, right? So you do this with a sense of criti critical intimacy, not with critical distance. So it can't happen with Pinterest, it can't happen with visual referencing. Once you draw your own intellectual references and then you, you know, keep drawing them out, be it, or you keep testing them, be it through drawing or making physical models or even making sort of virtual models, um, you will sort of start distilling the essence of things and create something which has you know, a sense of, 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 of being distinctive and bold. Um, our, I think what, what, what differentiates our, our projects might be the amount of technical details that we express. Because we believe that if you spend money on something, you should be able to express it. You don't need to then cover it with pastiche. So this, what a lot of our projects actually very clearly reveal how they are put together as opposed to hide things. That's interesting. So um, my next question for you is, as a musician, um, um, you know, someone who's musically inclined, do you think you view space differently as compared to perhaps even other architects? Um, I'm not sure if I view space differently, but I mean, being a musician, uh, especially for the kind of music I listen to and play, has changed me as a person. It has changed the way, or it has, well it's, it's too late to say it's changed me because I've been doing that for 30 years now, <laughs> but it has had an impact on how I engage with the world and engage with things. And of course that has an impact on how you tend to cross-reference and resolve things in architecture. 
right? In music, we I was taught how to post rationalize. Um, you know, so you play scales and polyrhythms and you know and modes, and you get into model theory, but you don't do you don't sort of compose based on that. You compose based on what you feel and your intuition, and that is part of your inherent skill set. And then you post rationalize it, and then once in a while you may use your theoretical knowledge of music to get out of a compositional situation. You also use your theoretical knowledge of music to understand what the other person may do, right? So that's a jazz scenario, so you know oh, where, where is this guy gonna go? But the true genius will always sort of jump way over the stereotypes or the, or the, or the rules that are set up for them in any world. That, that also is true for architecture. So I think one of the things we definitely do is take the obvious in our studio and then reject it, right? O over and over and over again, so that you find, you so so you go beyond the obvious, right? And that is what one is looking for, in, you know, in design. Yeah, but 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 also understand that it's, you know, just going straight to it's it's. I think it's very strange. It's very shallow, and really hard, to, to pull a rabbit out of your hat for the sake of it every time in design and the same applies for music right so and that's why you have it's hard to create a hit after hit in every in every album um, so while I I think consistency is overrated the consistency of a process or the refinement of a process can never be underrated and that's true for music as well as architecture tell us one thing that people don't know about Akshat Bhatt my life's an open book. What people don't know is that, um, well, I don't know. I, I've said everything. <laughs> um, people don't know what my favorite guitar is. And well, my favorite instrument is actually uh, the first one I ever got. It was in 93. It still remains my favorite. It stays locked in, locked in its case. What they also don't know is that um, I like to drive. Um, and I drive a lot. Um, maybe any other languages besides English, Hindi, you know? No, very boring that way. <laughs> no. um, what are your thoughts about sustainable design? And this will be the last question we're taking. <coughs> Look, oh, I mean, the, uh, I think sustainability has become a buzzword, but what you need to understand is that sustainability is a dynamic concept. The the, the 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 roots of which are very sim are, are the same that you know it is the ability to do things to make up to that that to do things in a manner where we meet our needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs now that keeps changing so is our electric cars the answer to sustainable development or or, or sustainable transport no they're not our internal combustion engines that no they're not but does the answer lie in using less private transport and more public transport? Possibly, right? So that, these are... Um, you had come up with these really interesting pod concepts, I remember, during the COVID times so yeah. for transport mm -hmm. and things like that. So any of that uh, has sort of come into practice? Uh, not yet. Um, you know, the, the, you know, that pod thing actually started with, uh, with the idea of sort of, wh when we realized how much it, cost the government to actually put a series of buses together and then what the overall infra network uh, achieves and I mean is what the overall in how complex the overall infra network is uh, to what it achieves mm -hmm. we also realized that most governments go into tremendous losses when they're running public transport you know that's mostly run been run for taxpayers money so when you have smaller modular uh, public transport systems you could actually have a fast and uh, which are which eliminate the you know the the need for interpersonal negotiation, be it financial or any other, right? Uh, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, be it financial or priority, you can you know you can probably come with a cleaner transportational network. Uh, that's what that project was about, and um, and I think it is through such significant change that you can start achieving sustainability goals. They have to start with 
the city and they have to start with the individual being sensitive to the needs of you know the people around them as well as the needs of cities thank you so much for joining us today akshat and we're at his really really beautiful studio it's really calm and serene and i don't know if you guys can get a shot of the area behind us we don't feel like leaving so i can people walk in by the way i know i said that was the last question but can people walk into your studio when they want to like uh, be an excuse to s- hang out at your studio and then hire you guys to as the architect yeah well people are always welcome to walk in there's enough space to have a coffee and uh, the coffee is great so uh, there's enough in most space um everyone's welcome i uh, will not everyone but people are generally not unwelcome in the studio come to architecture discipline for a great coffee and some interesting designs thank you so much akshat thank you for being with us thank you